thank you for the introduction and thank you for the invitation. Um, how many people in this room have ever been to Russia? I know you have. Oh, so many. Oh, wow, I'm impressed. Uh, so I gave a talk last night uh, to a different group, and I didn't ask this question. In fact, it turned out some people had been there. But I opened with the somewhat banal comment that uh, you know, Russia is a long way from Singapore. Russia is very unlike Singapore. Russia is um, northerly and, and cold. Uh, Singapore is on the equator and hot. Singapore is small. Russia is big. Singapore has managed to modernize its economy in a very impressive way. Russia has not really succeeded in doing this very, very well, at least. Um, Singapore has had a variety of political arrangements over the years. Uh, Russia had a communist dictatorship for 75 years. So in so many different ways, they are, they are different places. Um, and yet, um, what's been going on in Russia over the last several years um, has broader ramifications. We had a conference here that uh, Professor Wang Jing uh, presided over uh, earlier this week, uh, where we talked about the Ukraine crisis and its implications for world order. I was not planning on centering these brief remarks tonight on Ukraine. Um, it will come up more than once, but it, I'm not really going to give you a lecture on the Ukraine crisis. I um, would be happy, though, to respond to questions or comments that you had. So what I'm trying to tackle here is something a little different. There are points of intersection, of course, uh, but it's about nationalism and particularly Russian nationalism and the evolution of Putin's regime and the, and the uh, evolution of Russian society um, and the foreign policy implications of that. So a fair amount of what I'm going to be doing here is making distinctions. So th if there are experts in the room, some of this may be rather familiar territory, but I'm quite sure that most of you aren't going to consider yourselves to be expert on Rus experts on Russia. So I'll try and uh, find a middle ground. Um, so nationalism um, is a, a fact of life in most countries in the world today. I don't think there are too many places that don't have it at all. Um, and what we mean by nation, though, varies enormously from one setting to the other. And there is a school, a very powerful school of thought in this field coming out of anthropology, which holds that nations have essentially no uh, objective content. A nation is something that is subjectively constructed and imagined by people. Um, and this point, to the extent that it's valid, applies to all kinds of identities <coughs> in life and not just to, uh, not just to, to na nationalism. Um, so whether it's this construct is fully imagined or to some extent objective, object, objective and hard, what, what nation is, is a, some kind of sense of common origin, you know, that we belong together because we are fill in the blank, because we are French or we are British or slash English, of course, that's not quite the same thing, or because we are Canadian or we are American or we, we are Vietnamese or we are Singaporean. And when you think about those particular examples, I think you see right away uh, how much the, 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 the DNA and a specific content of nation uh, and nationalism vary from one place to the other. And then Singapore is probably just about as intricate an example of that point as you could find anywhere. Um, in Russia, there is not yet another complication, which is that um, the word Russian can be understood to mean a, a number of things, at least two, and, and, and some would say more than two. And the basic distinction I would make for my students when I t try and teach uh, this systematically is between uh, an ethnic definition of Russianness, um, which is about who the individual is and where he came from. Uh, so it might be like we would say about a Japanese person or a Chinese person. It's usually linked up with language more than any other uh, variable. And then secondly, though, um, we can talk about Russian, a Russian nation and Russian nationalism in what uh, scholars of the subject generally call this a civic or state sense. Um, 
So in Russia, these, these two definitions of Russianness have coexisted for much of the modern period, although historians go back now and they're, they're discovering that this distinction you know, didn't always apply. Uh, so the adjectives and well, the, the words are, are somewhat different. Ruski is the is the na narrow ethnic definition of Russian. Rasiski, so the root is the same, of course, uh, but it's rendered in different words. Rasiski has the adjective Rasianin, which is a very artificial 20th century word uh, as the noun. Um, so just to give you to be con more concrete about this, uh, present day Russia, which is, has two itself has two names, by the way, Russia and the Russian Federation. They're both enshrined in the Constitution. <clears throat> every every uh, citizen of the country is a civic, is a Russian in the civic sense, a citizen of Russia. Uh, a, a large majority of the citizens of Russia are also ethnic Russians. So for many, m most Russians actually share these two identities. But 20% of the population, a sizable minority or set of minorities are citizens of Russia but they are not ethnic Russians. So I know some of you are very familiar with this but for the others I just want to be sure you're clear on this particular point. So the soldier who's watching the missiles parading through Red Square is relating to Russia as a state. I don't see a Russian flag there but I'm sure they're not very far from the missile. Um, he, he, is, he serves in the armed forces of Russia uh, in the service of the Russian state. The fellow with the T-shirt that says, uh, I'm a Russian, Yaruski, he's celebrating the fact that he's an ethnic Russian. But they're, like I said, 20% of the population is a, a, a Russian in the civic sense, but not in the ethnic sense. 80% are both. Um, in the Soviet period, the Soviets, although they were internationalist in their orientation, uh, they wanted to build a world socialist Republic or Federation, they weren't that, that Russia centered at all. But the Soviets did, for their own reasons, decide to reify ethnic identities. So the Soviet Union was, I mean, de facto, it was the Russian state from 1917 to 1991, but it wasn't called the Russian state, it was called the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. And so it was, it was dedicated to an ideological project, essentially. But within the Soviet framework, Individuals of, were expected to be very clear on what their ethnic identity was. And so I don't know about Singapore exactly. I can make some surmises. In the United States, uh, which is, of course, a very multi-ethnic place, a melting pot, rather like Singapore, perhaps. Um, in the United States, you know, you can look at somebody and there's unless there's some skin color factor involved in some way, you don't, there's no particular way of telling what that person's ethnic identity is. That is, it resides in the, in the head of the individual. Um, every 10 years, the United States has a census, and uh, the census taker, when he knocks on the door, or she knocks on the door, will ask you what your ethnic um, identity is. But aside from that encounter, it doesn't really appear in any documents, or uh, it's, it's, it has little to do with public life or public concerns. But the Soviet Union was different. Starting, <coughs> excuse me, starting uh, in the early 1930s, the Soviet state undertook to ensure that every citizen of the country of the Soviet Union, not the Russia at the time, uh, would not only have to be expected to be clear about his ethnic, his or her ethnic identity, but it would be fixed in a document. So Alexander um, uh, is probably too young to remember when uh, everybody had to carry these documents, but the so-called internal passport, uh, which was an identity card that uh, Soviet citizens all carried on their person, the, the fifth point of that identity card said what your ethnicity was, and it was fixed and it was attached to you. <coughs> so this is rather iron ironic considering where the Soviet leadership started. They were initially not interested in this at all, but then for reasons of control, as much as anything else, moved in this direction. Uh, so ethnic identity has, ten has tended to be more fixed in this particular part of the world than it is in some other places. Um, oh, so these are just images from the Soviet period <coughs> of how the ethnic Russians were conceived of in relation to the population as a whole. So. On one level, 
the official myth was the Soviet state is a brand new thing. It's internationalist in its orientation. It's going to build communism on a world, world scale and all of that. But the fact is that the majority of the population was ethnic Russian, and their identity cards said that this was so. The Russian state had been around for a long time. Uh, just how long is a matter of debate and interpretation. Uh, <clears throat> Putin would tell you today, Gorbachev would have said the same thing, that Russia's roots go back, as a state, go back a thousand years or even longer, 1,100, 1,200 years. <clears throat> and so this is a long history for the last um, two and a half centuries, roughly, of its existence before communism. Russia was organized as an empire, not as a nation state. That empire was very large. It was not quite as big as the British Empire at its fullest extent. So this would resonate with Singaporeans. Uh, but it was very big, and it was, of course, continuous territory. It was an overland empire, not a maritime empire. Um, and then comes the Soviet period. So um, the Soviet leaders were quite interested um, after a decade or a decade and a half at the beginning when they kind of ignored the whole question. But for their own reasons, for, for reasons of state, they saw it as useful to start to build mental connections between the Soviet population with its ethnic Russian majority and the Russian past. Now, in fact, the poster on the left is a wartime poster from World War I, and it evokes not the empire, but actually uh, medieval Russian warriors. Um, <clears throat> the uh, two gentlemen with the um, clerical garb are actually patriarchs of the Russian Orthodox Church, appointed by Stalin. So Stalin, one of the links that he chose to draw with uh, the Russian past, again for reasons of state, was with Russia's religious tradition, despite the fact that the regime, of course, was, was atheistic. Um, Stalin more than once said things about the Russians. He himself was not an ethnic Russian, I'm sure you know. He was a Georgian, and he spoke Russian. He had a very soft voice. He spoke it with a, with a Caucasus accent. Um, so he was Rossiski, he was a civic Russian, perhaps we'd say today, but not an ethnic Ruski, not an ethnic Russian. Uh, and in this, this is probably the most famous quotation. There's Stalin sitting at a victory banquet in uh, May of 1945, surrounded by his marshals. Um, in fact, uh, this is just a snippet of the photograph. There are another probably 50 of these marshals and admirals and generals who fought and won the war against Nazi Germany. Uh, and he, he um, muses in this quotation about the Russian people, that is the ethnic Russian uh, core of the Soviet state, and pays them a rare compliment, well, kind of a compliment. <laughs> so he says, well, uh, I realize now looking back that we made a lot of mistakes during, in the early phases of the war, um, and any other you know, national group might have abandoned us at that point and said, you failed us, uh, it's time for you to go. But he said, no, the Russian people uh, aren't like that. They decided to stick with the Soviet uh, regime and to help us defeat Germany. Um, and uh, notice he refers to Ru the Russians, the ethnic Russians as the most outstanding of all the nations of the Soviet Union. They're leading because they have a clear mind, a hearty character, and patience. That is, they put up with governments that, that me mess things up and that abuse their citizens, for that matter. Um, one other background fact to note here is that um, the ethnic identities that were individual level and fixed in the passport and all the rest were linked up in what turned out to be a, a rather lethal fashion to the constitutional and organizational structure of the state. Now this, is, um, this slide shows today's Russian Federation. It's not the whole Soviet Union. Uh, if we were to look at the USSR as a whole, it would be even more complex. Um, the Soviet Union had 15, they were called Union Republics, one of which was a Russian re Republic, Russian in the civic sense, Rossiski. Um, and then it had, um, and, and all of the 15, except for the Russian Republic, were linked to a, an ethnic group. So whether it's Ukrainian, Estonian, Georgian, Kazakh, and so forth. Um, and then within some of these 15 republics, within a, within a subset of them, there were further um, subdivisions of the territory along ethnic lines. So this is today's Russia and the rep so-called republics, of which there are now 22. So Crimea, which was annexed a year ago, is now the 22nd Russian Republic. They're shown in green. Uh, and then there are other ethnically linked units that um, 
are in uh, somewhat different hues. But what you notice here is that the republics of Russia, so Russia has currently, I think it's 85 units, in American terms, states. Um, and of those, roughly a quarter are, are designated as linked with a particular ethnic group. That these, um, and they, they account for about 20% of the population. The territory involved here is, in some cases, very, very large. So Saka, or Yakutia, as it's also known, is you know, half the size of Western Europe. It's an absolutely immense uh, space. Um, so this is an, a, a further complication. Now, just, uh, I said I wasn't really going to try to lecture um, in, a, over a, uh, in a clearly strategic way about the Ukrainian crisis of the last year, but these images just remind you what's been going on. Uh, a revolution, uh, an insurrection revolution in Ukraine, which was one of the 15 Soviet republics. Uh, eventually the annexation of the Crimean Peninsula, and then since last April, May, a, a, a very vicious war in the easternmost provinces of Ukraine, which, where Russia has been arming <clears throat> and aiding uh, rebels who are opposing the central government. That conflict is not just about ethnic considerations, but it's certainly about identity, and it's about language, and it's about history. Um, <clears throat> all right, so let, let me get more concrete about Nash nationalism and what it means and might mean in politics. So the, the main point to take away from this is that this is very complicated. Um, and well, it is anywhere. You know, if we were going to have a discussion of national and ethnic uh, politics in the United States, it would be very complicated. In Singapore, it would be complicated. In Russia, it's maybe even more complicated. <clears throat> so I'm distinguishing here ab among three uh, basic varieties, which I call small Russia, big Russia, and narrow Russia. Um, and uh, so these are the logical possibilities, some of them at least, for the kind of political expressions of these points of view. And as you can see, there are a lot of them. And they, they have, you know, it, this comes in different flavors. Some of them are rather banal and ordinary, you might find almost anywhere. Some of the others, uh, though, are not necessarily, um, uh, are not necessarily uh, benevolent or, or normal uh, at all. So, I mean, the list extends from patriotic pride in one's country and its achievements on one extreme to, you know, Nazism at the other extreme. These are all expressions in, of some kind of nationalism. Um, so these are the logical possibilities. Small Russia, big Russia, narrow Russia. Small Russia is basically Russia as it has existed since the breakup of the Soviet Union 20-odd uh, years ago. Uh, and uh, operating in that framework, national feeling and nationalism uh, can be, um, can take four or five, six different forms. I, I might also mention here, <clears throat> which I did earlier this week, that um, in the Russian language, the word nationalism and nationalist, the, the word nationalist as well, uh, these are terms that are uh, used in a very pejorative sense. So it's good to be a patriot, patriot, um, it's bad to be a nationalist. So even though we as external observers may label these activities as nationalist, most of the players themselves would not call themselves nationalists. Um, so small Russia is Russia essentially as it exists today. Big Russia is, is a Russian entity. So this would be nationalism that's related to a Russia that's larger than today's Russia. Uh, so the historical references here are to the Russian Empire of 1700 to 1917, uh, and of course the Soviet Union, um, which was in many ways a continuation of the empire. Uh, territorially, it was the uh, it coincided almost completely with the former Russian Empire. Um, but big Russia is not just limited to actual states that occurred in the past. There's also uh, an idea of Eurasianness out there, which we could talk about if you wish, Pan-Slavism, which would link Russia with other uh, countries with Slavic cultures. Uh, and then finally, narrow Russia. This is the one that's hardest to label, uh, and I'll, I'll give you some concrete examples in a moment. But this is, uh, this is nationalism in its more negative and biting uh, form and more conflict-prone form. Uh, so, the, you know, small Russian, small Russian nationalism, we can call it that, is, as I say, fairly, it, it, it's, 
fairly clo close in its form and content to what you would find in many, many countries. Um, whereas, and big Russian nationalism is different in that there are possibilities of thinking big um, that come directly out of history. Um, and this possibility is not open to probably the majority of the countries in the world. Uh, and then finally, narrow Rus Russian nationalism is the one that's potentially most explosive politically, so we'll return to it. Um, now, Yeltsin was Russia's first leader. He was president from 1991 until he retired uh, in 2000. And um, we don't normally think of Yeltsin as a Russian nationalist, but he, uh, he selected from this repertoire certain things that made sense to him, but rejected many of the others. So uh, you'll notice I've crossed out pretty well the whole narrow Russia column. Ru Yeltsin just wasn't interested in these things. He also um, believed that some of them might be uh, some of them might be harmful to the state. Um, so he wasn't anti-minority. He wasn't anti-migrant. He certainly wasn't anti-Semitic, and he was not a Nazi. Um, but he was, though, a small Russian nationalist, so he believed in patriotic pride, cultural reclamation, national unity, and great powerism. Well, th those were all part of Yeltsin's world. And national unity meant that the ethnic Russian majority, which was now 80% of the uh, population, in the last decade or so of the Soviet period, ethnic Russians came to just 51% of the Soviet population. So they were a very narrow majority, but they had a much greater majority in the new Russia. But it, national unity had to do with working out the relationship between the Russian majority, the ethnic Russian majority, and the other groups, of which there were dozens. And in the name of national unity, Yeltsin waged a war in Chechnya. This is a somewhat forgotten conflict, but you know there was a violent encounter with a minority on Russia's southwestern frontier. In fact, there were two Chechen wars. One was fought entirely uh, under Yeltsin. The second one was initiated by Yeltsin and, and, and won by Putin after Yeltsin's retirement. Um, now, let's compare that with Putin. The repertoire um, is the same. The repertoire of possibilities is the same. But Putin's um, inclinations are considerably broader. Now, you have to realize, again, there's potentially all kinds of contradiction here, right? Uh, small, big, narrow. Can you be these, all of these things simultaneously? Well, there's, there is some juggling involved, no question about it. Yeltsin, um, for Yeltsin, this was not a top priority. Um, he thought less about it. He worried less about it. He didn't agonize about it all that much. In Putin's case, I think this is much uh, closer to the heart of his personal identity, and his, um, uh, it is a much higher priority in terms of what his government has done. So um, comparing one with the other, um, notice that under small Russia, um, I said that um, I show here that you know Yeltsin wasn't very interested in things like anti-Americanism, anti-globalism. Putin certainly is. In fact, he engages in all of the um, reper uh, repertoire components from column one, including patriotic pride, great powerism, non-interference in inter internal affairs, which is somewhat of a ide fix with him. You don't mess with us internally. Anti-globalism, anti-Americanism. Um, as you move to the right, though, even Putin is somewhat selective. Um, he is much more interested in big Russia than um, Yeltsin was. Yeltsin, w most of the time, was fairly relaxed about this. He, he didn't think the Soviet Union could be reconstituted. It was impossible to even think along these lines. And he w uh, believed that, um, that uh, um, a, a, a big Russia might gradually take shape through a process of peaceful adjustment, but he certainly wasn't interested in going to war for that purpose. And if you look at the third column, here, here's where we run into behavior, behaviors that require a little bit more elucidation. So um, narrow Russia, which is Russia in the more ethnic sense, actually does appeal to Putin, I think considerably more than it did to Yeltsin. Um, and, uh, but it's not to say that uh, Putin is a narrow Russian nationalist in every conceivable sense of the phrase, because that is not the case. So Putin is certainly not anti-minority. He's not anti-migrant. He's not anti-Semitic. Um, and, and needless to say, he's not a Nazi. Um, and this is significant. Um, so anti-minority, for example, it would be one thing if 
Putin was pursuing a, a policy which was um, somehow opposed to or derogatory of non-Russian minorities uh, within the Russian Federation. But he, he does not do that, uh, and I don't think he ever will. That's not his thing. Um, and it may surprise you a bit to, to hear that in elections, of which he's now been involved in quite a few, uh, that non-Russians, ethnic non-Russians, the ethnic non-Russian minorities of Russia, vote for Putin with even greater enthusiasm than, than ethnic Russians do. Um, nor is he anti-migrant. We'll talk about migration more in a, in a second. And that's more, I think, a kind of prudential calculation on his part. Um, but there's no evidence of anti-migrant sentiment, let alone anti-Jewish settlement. So the surprise here, this is why I circled it, is irredentism. So this is really new, okay? Irredentism in the sense of making claims to territory in an adjacent state on the basis of some kind of national or ethnic uh, identity. Uh, and this was very far from how Yeltsin thought, and frankly, it, it, Putin himself showed very little interest in this until rather recently. Now maybe somebody's gonna go back over the dozens or hundreds of speeches that he's, he made um, since 2000 and find traces of it. I've not tried to do that myself. I, I will say, um, if you're interested in this at all, you might look at a, a document called the Millennium Manifesto. That's the English description. So this is a long memorandum that was written over Putin's name in December 1999, just as, as Yeltsin was about to make him acting president, and then he was elected president a few months later. And in this Millennium Manifesto, of course, Putin didn't write it personally. A, a, a group wrote it for him, but these were definitely his sentiments. He talks about Russia's problems and Russia's priorities, and he basically doesn't mention any of this stuff. Um, he does refer to the need for Russia to catch up with the West uh, in order to be secure, which is a long-standing claim. Uh, there's a certain amount of patriotism in there, but there's certainly no, not the slightest reference to anything that might be linked to irredentism. So uh, was he concealing his true ambitions at the time? Uh, and in recent years has just acted out what he'd always preferred, or I, what I think is much more likely, have his preferences shifted? Um, and so my tentative answer to this question, my own question would be it's more likely the second. But um, it's probably true that we don't know enough at this point to be absolutely certain that this is so. Um, so just to give you an example of recent rhetoric by Putin that falls into the, um, that would um, sharpen the question just a bit. He has said now on several occasions that Crimea, so this beautiful peninsula in the Black Sea that Russia annexed last March, <clears throat> is sacred territory for Russians. Uh, and uh, he gave, I think it was in December last year, a couple of months ago, uh, he claimed that Crimea was as um, holy a place for Russians as the Temple Mount was for Jews. The Temple Mount in Jerusalem was for Jews. Well, uh, if he said it, he must believe it. On the other hand, you will look in vain in, in earlier um, rhetoric for the slightest reference to this kind of thing. Um, now, the Devaldi Discussion Club, which uh, I was at, as was uh, uh, Wang Jing, uh, in October, um, he was asked a question about Russian nationalism by a Russian-American so this is somebody with rather complex identity issues himself, named Zlobin. And Zlobin said, I appreciate, uh, you know, Mr. President, how you have all, uh, you know, a patriotic upsurge in Russia, and this is not necessarily a bad thing, but it seems to me that um, things are moving towards a more kind of pointed and extreme form of nationalism, which remember again for a Russian is always understood to be a negative term. We use it more objectively. Um, and Putin says, you know, it's worth reading as I'm speaking. You might want to just read through that paragraph. And Putin says, you know, you're right. Uh, patriotism, which is good, can turn into nationalism, which is bad. Uh, and this is a very dangerous tendency. We have to be sure this doesn't happen. But then right in the middle of the paragraphs, paragraph, you notice him saying, the biggest nationalist in Russia is me. So this is maybe a slip of the tongue. Why did he choose that word at this point? This was an unrehearsed comment in, re in response to a question. Um, so then he kind of catches himself and says, well, nationalism is you know, not necessarily 
uh, unacceptable by definition, but it's got to um, benefit the people. Uh, and, and then it, uh, towards the end, he concedes that uh, even if nationalists, and he has said here, I'm the number one nationalist in Russia, uh, do the right thing, uh, this can be taken to um, an extreme and can take forms that are very harmful to a country that is, as he puts it here, multinational and multiconfessional. So again, Russia is not just 145 million Russians, it's 145 million people, of whom 80% are Russians and 20% are fill in the blank. Um, Tatars, Bashkirs, Chechens, Ukrainians, and so forth. Uh, so that's a kind of impromptu um, uh, alert to the complexity of this issue. Um, nationalist politics in Russia is, um, of course, in the end, going to have to be filtered through the behavior and preferences of the leader of the country, um, who has been in place for now 15 years. Uh, nothing is going to happen without Putin signing off. But that doesn't mean that everything that happens in Russia happens because Putin you know, has a, a preconceived notion of what to do and acts out his preferences. In fact, uh, although that can happen, much of the time I think Russian politics is driven by ideas that come from somewhere else or come from some broad context that influences Putin or that he himself is part of. And so since we're talking about nationalism, I thought you would be interested to see um, pic pictures of a few um, individuals I call nationalist entrepreneurs. Zhirinovsky used to be the best known of these people. He's been around since 1990 or 1991. Zhirinovsky is a politician, uh, and he's a kind of populist nationalist who is um, basically somewhat vacuous uh, rhetoric, has been around for many years. And he, he play, harps on and plays on the issue without it leading him anywhere in particular. Bielov, over here, um, to the right, upper right, Bielov is an ethnic Russian nationalist, and in fact, he's, um, he's a, quite an extreme character. Uh, his main contribution has been anti-migrant sentiment, but he really is a ra racially, mo to some extent, racially motivated uh, Russian nationalist, of a, to me at least, of a pretty nasty strike. Nikonov, um, on the lower right, um, somebody I've known well for many years, uh, he's more of a soft power Russian nationalist who's involved in a project called Ruski Mir, Russian World, which is um, engaged in promoting Russian language and culture uh, outside of Russia. So it's, uh, it, it's soft power activity. Um, Dugan is Russians, uh, the one with the green, uh, the green board, the green blackboard. Uh, Alexander Dugan is Russia's leading Eurasianist. Um, so he wants, he, he wants a big Russia um, and would like to see the Soviet uh, territorial uh, um, form, at least, uh, restored to, to some extent. And Strokov, the fi final figure on the lower left, well, Strokov is a Russian who served in the secret services for decades, but was the main instigator of the, the anti-Kiev uh, insurrection in eastern Ukraine in uh, April, May, June uh, 2014. So Strelkov uh, is a, uh, well, I'm not, I'm not sure I could accurately t uh, characterize his beliefs. He is, he is narrow Russian nationalist in certain regards, but he also, um, you see strains there of big Russia as well. And Strelkov led a band of um, amateur warriors into a middle-sized Ukrainian city called Slavyansk, which they took over in, I think it was May of 2014, and it was this particular act that triggered the, uh, the war in, in the Donbass. He's now back in Russia. He was wounded in, in combat last summer and was evacuated. Basically, Putin, uh, somebody at least at the top in Russia, decided to get him out of there. Um, they felt he was doing more harm than good. Um, now, uh, this, so this is anti-migrant na Russian nationalism, and until the Ukraine crisis erupted a year ago. This was, in fact, if, if we're thinking of nationalism that many of us would regard as politically, not only politically salient, but politi politically harmful, then this was probably the most notable um, form that it took. The Ruski March, uh, Russian March, and this is Ruski in the narrow sense, right, occurs, uh, I think the first one was held in 2005, something like that. 
So the, the date was not chosen arbitrarily. Um, in Soviet days, uh, Russians celebrated the uh, anniversary of the October Revolution uh, that brought the communists, the Bolsheviks, to power in 1917. They celebrated that, uh, that day, however, in November because the Russians changed their calendar in 1918. So strangely enough, on November 7th, they celebrated the anniversary of the Great October Socialist Revolution. Um, that was on November 7th. Uh, Putin decided um, a decade ago that uh, he wanted to get rid of this holiday because Russia was post-communist and it was all kind of archaic. And so they decided, to, however, to hold another holiday because Russians are very attached to these holidays around the same time, but they selected another day. And that day was November 4th, which is called the Day of National Unity, I believe it is, or Concord or something like that. It happens to be the date in 1612 when Polish and Lithuanian soldiers were evicted from the Moscow Kremlin during a period of internal instability. So that's why they chose that particular date. And um, so some nationalist entrepreneurs decided to stage a march, which they would call the Russian March, on November 4th, 2000, and I think it was 2005. And the march in, uh, originally wasn't just about migration, it was a, about um, more about historical and symbolic matters, but eventually it was taken over by anti-migrant groups, of which there are many. Now, why, why anti-migrant? Well, it's because Russia, once its economy recovered from the 1990s, it entered a period of growth. Uh, it had a severe labor shortage, uh, as certainly many countries do, uh, and it started uh, opening the gates to large numbers of workers from other countries, most of which were ex-Soviet states, particularly in Central Asia. Uh, and so, we're talking about millions of people here in the city of Moscow, maybe one and a half million, two million migrant laborers somehow being squeezed into the city and living often in very, uh, very bad quarters. So this is a backlash against migration. Uh, some of these people are probably would characterize as normal. Others are definitely um, rac racially motivated. So the Ruski Marsh eventually takes this form. So it was the, um, uh, it, it was the, the most, prominent, certainly, example of Russian nationalism in internal politics for a number of years. The government disapproved of this march, but was never willing to ban it. Uh, and I think at the beginning, they thought uh, that maybe this was a way of letting off social steam. It wasn't all that harmful. Uh, and you know, it was about nationalism, which meant that maybe it could be used for the state's own purposes. Um, now. This, kind of, this anti-migrant uh, activity has a violent streak to it. So the, the Ruski Marsh itself has never been violent, but people associated with this kind of politics uh, can be potentially quite violent. So this is the best known, the so-called Maniege pogrom. Notice where it takes place, right outside the Kremlin gates. This was a flash mob thing that organized through social media. It followed a fight, a, a fist and knife fight, at a soccer game, a football game, uh, elsewhere in Moscow that occurred several days before this. The fight pitted local Russian boys against um, individuals from the Caucasus somewhere. Uh, and one of the Russian kids was 18 years old, I think, uh, died from his wounds. Uh, and so the ethnic or nationalist entrepreneurs decided to make a major issue out of this and they organized an ethnic riot of very large proportions. I don't know what the exact number was, but thousands and thousands for sure. Uh, and this crowd uh, noticed the, the uh, Nazi type salute. So this was, became very common in these, in these events. Now fortunately, no one was killed in this uh, pogrom, but lots of people were, in, were injured, mostly from minority, visible minority groups who were beaten up by the crowd and, and the police managed to save their lives, but that's about all they managed to do. Now I could give you more examples of this. This particular event uh, actually was quite shocking for the government. This, you know, was not what they wanted to condone. And after this event, they actually banned quite a few of the anti-migrant groups. So they, they adopted decrees, um, uh, you know, dissolving these groups. And they actually threw the leaders of some of them into jail for a while, although I think they weren't there for that long. Um, now, we have a fair amount of <clears throat> evidence from public opinion surveys about Russians actually think about these range of issues. This is just a few responses I thought you would find interesting. Um, so as you can see, there are sizable minorities, if not always majorities, of people uh, who 
uh, subscribe to views that one could see as nationalist uh, in the narrow Russian sense. So about 40% of uh, Russian citizens would, would agree that non-Russians are to blame for many of Russia's misfortunes. Um, almost 50% uh, agree that national minorities have too much power in Russia. Uh, half of all um, the population uh, agrees with the slogan, no more feeding the Caucasus. So the reference here is to government programs to develop the Caucasus, the North Caucasus region, which is part of Russia, which is where Chechnya is. This, these have been very, very costly programs, and so the sentiment here is, let's not waste our money on the minorities. Uh, Russia for the Russians. Okay, so this is a slogan, Rasiya da Ruskih. Um, it's actually a 19th century slogan, and it, its connotations were a bit different then. Um, but it, w what it says is really, uh, you know, Rus Russia as a civic uh, and state entity should have first-class citizens and second-class citizens. Now, you know, there are Russians who will debate you on this and say, well, it isn't necessarily that, that way, but this, this is probably the most straightforward interpretation. So as you can see, public opinion on this one is pretty well split. So this is from a survey that I did in 2012. Roughly half of Russians agree with that statement, and, uh, but half disagree with that statement. Um, and then the uh, questions in the lower part of the panel uh, relate to um, the Ukraine crisis. So I'm throwing these in here. Um, notice 85% of Russians uh, as of uh, August 2014 agree that the annexation of Crimea was a big achievement. Um, and, and yet, uh, so the responses towards the bottom of this would require some interpretation if you want to get into it in detail. Actually, relatively few. So you see 85% think annexation of Crimea was great. Glad we did it. But actually, very small minorities favor any further territorial annexations at Ukraine's expense. Um, now, I, 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 I came across this stuff uh, a few months ago, and I thought it also told you something about what's going on. So, <clears throat> you know, nationalism is ultimately an affair of the heart rather than the head. It's, you know, there's, it has a very strong psychological and emotional component because it goes back to some notion of shared origin, right? where you come from, where your home is. Um, and you see the responses to these questions about Russia for the Russians and so forth. Um, they tell you what individuals will reply in a survey when they're asked to respond, um, but they don't really tell you how important these sentiments are to the people. There, there's no salience uh, dimension. So this question kind of gets, gets, sorry, gets to the salience in what I thought was a rather um, interesting way. So they asked, this is on the eve of the November holiday, which uh, is now on November 4th. Uh, and it's not just one day, by the way, it's a number of days, three or four days in duration. What do you plan to do? Um, on the holiday. Well, it, it, people used to celebrate it as the um, Revolution Day, the anniversary of the October Revolution. So that's the, the default Soviet response. But what the government wants um, the Russians to do today is to celebrate national unity, popular unity. That's what the day is named after. And then there are some people who say, I'm not, I don't want, plan to celebrate anything, thank you very much, or I have no response. So the really amusing thing here is you can see the decline in the, th in the second row. So this is the slow fading of the communist, uh, you know, um, Soviet mentality. So it goes from 21% to 12%, and eventually I, I assume it'll end up around 4 or 5%, something like that. Um, what the government is pushing, and they want people to do is, you know, let's celebrate it the way Putin wants it to celebrate it, which is national unity, expelling the Poles in 1612 and all of that. But in fact, there's absolutely no trend in that direction. Only about 20% of Russians were said, when we, we get the day off, we're gonna celebrate national unity. Most people said, I uh, have no plans to celebrate either. It's going to be a day off. We'll go to the dacha to close it up, whether it's getting cold, or we'll just stay home and have a feast or something. But I, I actually don't see anything to celebrate here. So that's a little bit of a corrective to um, public opinion data that, that uh, is really not forthcoming on the salience dimension. So let me move towards uh, concluding this. Uh, after the Crimean an annexation, so we're talking about events of very recent months, um, the attitude toward the Ruski March on November 4th <coughs> shifted, at the top, I mean. So these are pictures of the march as it occurred last November 4th. So Crimea was annexed in March. The Donbass war in Ukraine begins in April, May. 
uh, Western sanctions click in in the summer and early fall of 2014. This time around, the government decided not to take any chances. They wanted to get direct control of this event. And they did two things. First of all, they refused to allow the marchers to, to march in central Moscow, where they'd always been allowed to do it before. They said, we have a nice industrial zone out there 15 miles away with factory smokestacks and so forth. You can have your march, but that's where it has to be. No, it won't be downtown. And they then, though, infiltrated the march for the first time and stuck in the messages that they wanted to get across. So this is, this is the government using this event and its emotional tug for its own purposes. So one sign is, he says here in Russia, Putin, the people, Russia. And previously, this march made no reference to Putin. And then Russia without a fifth column, uh, you know, people who might betray it. And then, of course, portraits of Putin everywhere. Um, here's one other one. Uh, so this is from a, 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 a small downtown spin-off from the suburban march. Uh, so this is the Russian bear on the balloon. Uh, and it says, um, the bear, so Russia, in other words, uh, never surrenders its taiga, its territory. So this is basically linking uh, a certain form of Russian nationalism with Crimea and saying, now that it's ours, you know, don't, don't even think of touching it. But it doesn't really have, in any of this imagery, the major themes that this march had in the past, which were largely about opposition to migration. Um, so I think I can, I believe this is my last, yeah. So let me just conclude with this, which I, uh, is my attempt to pull some of this together. So nationalist politics in Russia, I think, is um, very complex. It's multi-layered. The, the little image I showed you in my title page was of matryoshka dolls, which tend to be nested within one another. It's not one single thing or one simple thing. And I, I don't, I'm not making a claim here for Russian uniqueness. I think there are many other countries where this might be the case. Singapore, in India, the United States. Uh, you know, we, we, we um, all have our own ways of dealing with this complexity. But I, I find this tripartite division into pro-system, within-system, and anti-system politics to be somewhat helpful. So this comes from me. I kind of made this up, my attempt to um, simplify things just a bit. And these three kinds or three genres of ethnic and nationalist politics are, coexist in Russia at present time. Um, and to, so to some extent, the, what the government wants to do, of course, is to use nationalism in forms of which they approve to make it, it stronger. Uh, and I give you just examples here of, of you know, the kinds of themes that it seeks to sound. Association with the greatness of Russia's past, rally around the flag, endure hardship, isolate the regime from external influences. This has become more prominent uh, in the last several years. It's anti-global, it's anti-American. I don't think it's anti-Singapore, but if you give them the chance, they might come up with that too. Um, so this is trying to use nationalism and national sentiment to reinforce the political status quo. Within system, nationalist politics is not about making the system stronger, but it's about making the system work for you. And this game is not just played by the regime, not just played by the government. In fact, there are lots of actors, uh, and it's quite public, um, and uh, there's no censorship involved that I'm aware of in particular. Uh, and i just give you a few examples here. Minorities seeking to maintain their rights and privileges uh, and to some extent to expand them. So the republics of Russia, the now 22 republics of Russia, uh, all have certain linguistic uh, privileges. That is the local, the language of the local majority uh, must be taught in the public schools, uh, must be used uh, in street signs and you know things of that nature. Um, and every now and then, centralizers seek to reduce these rights and privileges. The locals fight back. Uh, and in some cases, in fact, the locals uh, are trying and have a certain amount of success in expanding these rights. So just for example, in Tatarstan, which is the most important of the non-Russian republics, the local government intends to phase out the Cyrillic alphabet. And I don't, I don't think they're going to pull this off, but the Tatar language is a Turkic language. Um, almost everybody in Tatarstan is perfectly fluent in Russian. That is the national language, of course. But the local um, titular group, as they call it, has its own language, which is Tatar. Um, and Tatar historically was rendered in an Arabic script. 
the Soviet, the Bolsheviks, the Soviets uh, changed that into the Latin alphabet in the 1920s, and then in the 1930s they transferred it into Cyrillic, which is the 30, 33 character, 33 letter Russian script. And what um, Tatarstan wants to do is to de-Cyrillicize uh, the Tatar language, which has happened in Central Asia, for example, outside of Russia. Uh, whether they'll get away with it is not yet clear. But So this is a pretty good example of this kind of politics. Lobbying over resources and budgets. Controversy over religious education. This is a really interesting one. So the o Russian Orthodox Church is the monopoly religious confession of the Russian ma uh, majority in the population. Uh, and it is very close to the government and rarely misses an opportunity to promote its own interests, which are uh, rather complex. Uh, they have to do with property, with access to um, access to the president, all sorts of things. Um, but uh, about eight or nine years ago, the, the then patriarch, Alexei, who has since died and been replaced by someone else, decided that he was going to try and talk Putin into instituting mandatory instruction in the Orthodox faith in all sc elementary schools in Russia. This is what they lobbied for. And Putin not wanting to offend the patriarch and you know, n never wanting to give up a political advantage, agreed only to a kind of pilot project, which was done, I think, in 2007, 2008. Um, and so two things happened, and I'll be very brief on this one. Um, eventually, they did institute a nationwide um, system for g providing not, uh, it's supposed to be information to, to kids, 9, 10, 11-year-old kids, about religion. So it's not a re religious indoctrination, it's instruction about religions. But the or so the Orthodox had their way on that point, but it turned out what the government delivered after lobbying by the other uh, groups involved was religious uh, instruction that was not just about Orthodoxy. In fact, parents were allowed to choose which classes their kids attended. They could go to Orthodox, Muslim, Buddhist, or Jewish. And finally, they had two other options, one of which was called, I think, religions of the world, and finally, um, secular ethics. So you know what happened was, uh, eventually this program was instituted, I think it started about two years ago, something like 60% of the parents in most parts of Russia opted for either secular ethics or religions of the world. Very few chose to send their kids to the Orthodox classes. So this is a good example, again, of within-system politics. It doesn't challenge the overall framework or status quo. It doesn't challenge the regime. But it seeks advantage within the system. And finally, anti-system. Well, this is the most interesting one. And just to, to end on this point, uh, anti-system, uh, well, there are certainly non-Russian nationalists out there, especially in the North Caucasus, who would like to see the Russian state, um, if not broken up, at least reduced in size. So there are. Uh, independence movements, they're rather small, but um, these often by now have a strong Islamic connection as well. So there are anti-system forces out there. They don't want to play within the system. They don't want to support the system. They want to harm the system or break up the system. Uh, as for Russians, the government's concern here is that overly rigid responses to demands by minorities are going to uh, alienate the minorities and, and conceivably raise uh, problems for national security. They have the same motivations on migration. Um, so there may be some individual officials who are prejudiced against migrant workers, but most, I think, Russian officials accept that these people have been very indispensable in the Russian labor market. Moreover, they pay enormous amounts of uh, financial support remittances to their home countries, all of which are part of Russia's sort of foreign policy orbit. <clears throat> so the government does not want to um, to cut off this flow of migration. So you see a tension here. Um, and then ultranationalism, risky irredentism, that's the extreme form. So I just mentioned this in conclusion. The irredentism that was manifested in the annexation of Crimea was unique, um, a unique event. And it's the one that has us on the outside, I guess, worried the most. And there's good reason to worry here. What I've tried to get across in this uh, talk is that it's not the only game in town. There's a lot else going on. It's more complex than it might seem from a distance. Um, and it's worth trying to understand the overall contours of the phenomenon. OK, I will stop at that.